could explain a little bit when you say there are internet rules what do you mean by rules I mean it seems to be maybe it's in a technical sense what what do you mean by rules on the internet thank you yes by rules I mean uh, technical specifications that dictate so so it's a word from law usually but the way I mean it is that there are specifications that tell com people who are designing computer devices how to make their devices compatible with others. So a lot of you are holding smartphones. There are actually approximately 350 at last count technical standards, which are pieces of paper. They're electronic, but they're, they're written text that explain how to design the various technologies so that it would do certain things, such as being interoperability. Uh, interoperable with other devices. So it's a very interesting issue that protocols are not software. Protocols is another word for these rules. They're not software, they're not hardware, but they're, actual te they're actually text. So you could view these. Uh, what I should have done is put, a, put up a slide with one of these specifications, but it's, it's very technical. So it's not software code, it's not hardware, but they're the specifications that if computing devices follow, they can uh, interoperate with other devices. It's a matter of creating the rules that allow greater access for the internet? Yes, so, so these are set by primarily private institutions made up primarily of people from private industry. And when they make decisions about something, I'll just give you one quick example that's, that's understandable. They have to decide things such as what kind of a unique identifier they have to design into a system so that it can be found on the internet. Now, you can make a decision such as the following. Do we want that unique identifier to be the hardware identifier that's physically within your computer, that's unique in the world? Or do we want it to be a virtual identifier that's logically unique but not tied to your hardware? So some of you may realize when I ask that question, if you choose the hardware identifier, then you have this ecosystem of being able to track people based on their hardware. So this is, a, this is an example of the kind of policy decision that is designed in to a system. It's the same thing with disability standards. You have to have the ability when you design something like having a, a, a description of an image, that has to be able to be read by any computing device. So there are standards that are built into the systems that help to provide this kind of policy area. One final thought. If we have these policy areas that are being set by private institutions and not by traditional nation state governance, it brings up a host of governance issues related to legitimacy and to accountability and transparency. So it's a very interesting area. And at the microphone. Uh, yes, uh, Bob Dinnerstein from the law school. And thank you all for uh, both the actual and the virtual presentations from Derek. Uh, they were terrific and very thoughtful. Um, I think one of the things that is interesting about this project is we know that technology opens up all kinds of opportunities for people with disabilities, but at the same time it, there present barriers which we've seen. And part of what I think the challenge is is to design the systems we have with people with disabilities in mind. Too often we design something without thinking about them and then later have to retrofit back. It's more expensive that way. And it also says something about what our understanding of access might be. Uh, there's actually a lot of additional things going on in the law school that could connect to this and I won't go into them except to mention one, which is we're having a conference on April 5th called the Cherry Blossom Conference. It's Peter Yazzie and Michael Carroll and others in the, uh, our, uh, our Pidget project at the law school are putting on. And it's this year it's about the intersection of uh, intellectual property and disability policy. So one of the things we're, so we're talking about a lot of the same things uh, that, that you all have talked about in terms of not only the sub specifics of some things that have arisen, but just the different worldview that that protecting content in the copyright world when it runs up against universal access issues for the disability world, if you will. So I really, uh, I'm happy to, you know, to send a link to that to anybody, but I would really encourage people to come. I think it's going to be great. Thank you. So you've gotten a very nice example of colleagues across the university working together on solving common problems, big problems of our time. And we tend to think of, in, think of interdisciplinarity and when we're thinking as, as people too immersed in, in administrative structures of universities as being cross schools, but of course the interdisciplinarity can happen, it really happens across disciplines. Um, last year, about this time last year, a little bit later this time last year, Provost Bass in his annual address to the faculty threw up a slide that was 
a slide of approximately 20 people across the, all across the College of Arts and Sciences, as it turned out, who were working in the field of neuroscience. And the way in which what was then the, the BCAN program, the Behavior Cognition and Neuroscience program, reached out to people like Sarah in the School of Education, Teaching, and Health, like our colleague Fernanda Benedon in the, in the, in the Department of Music, who's interested in, 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 in microtiming for jazz, uh, and all across the sciences here at AU, and brings people together in a common mission. And one of the, I think, the pr premier uh, purpose of AU 2030 is to do precisely that in a very systematic but nonetheless grassroots way. Elemental, sort of absolutely central to the planning for what is now the Center for Behavioral Neuroscience for some discussions that Tony and Scott and I had about the spring of 2010, if I remember correctly, in which we saw the possibility of a center that would bring these people together in a very serious way. I'm pleased to say, and I'll get to Terry in just a moment, that with Terry Davidson's leadership, we, this, uh, this, already this semester was in January, wasn't it? had a conference, a full day conference on a Saturday at which approximately 20 scientists presented their work for 20 minutes and really felt a sense of common bonds and a sense of common mission in the larger area of neuroscience. With that, let me introduce two people who I have no more admiration for these two people and for Sarah than I have for anyone else in the world. Tony Riley has been chair of the Department of Psychology for 12 years, correct? 15? 13. 13 years, he's, a, he's about to step down and go on a well-deserved sabbatical, having postponed his sabbatical, you can do the calculation a number of times. Um, you would think that having been chair of a department of psychology for 13 years, remember psychology is undergraduate, graduate, uh, uh, master's, uh, PhD, uh, laboratory work, uh, animal facility, you would think that someone who is responsible for all that wouldn't get any scholarship done, right? Tony, last count, I think the last time Tom Hughes had counted it for me, had done 40 articles in three years. Tony is an amazing mentor. He won a, an award last year uh, from Georgetown University for his mentorship. And if you go to any conference presentation in the sciences around this university, you will see legions, and I mean legions of Tony's students presenting truly excellent work. So we have in Tony Riley an amazing scholar teacher. I think he's won the scholar teacher uh, award, of, award and could, could win it many times. We have brought to the Department of Psychology Dr. Terry Davidson, who comes to us from Purdue University. He founded a center at Purdue, which went on to become, if I remember correctly, Terry, the biggest uh, center in terms of funding and, and size at, at, at Purdue University. We brought him to be professor of psychology and also director of a new center for behavioral neuroscience. Uh, uh, Terry has been funded, Terry does incredibly interesting work about the blood brain barrier. You, don't want to invite Terry to a, a meal with dessert because it puts him in a very odd position where if he, he gets, and he'll tell you, probably tell you why it's putting him in a odd position. It puts him in a very odd position because if he doesn't eat the dessert, you think you're gonna get, develop cognitive deficits. So he, he'll, he'll get into this. Terry has been an amazing addition to um, the American University faculty. He's precisely the kind of faculty that we want to be recruited because they're catalysts, catalysts. They bring people together and energize them in new ways. So welcome to Terry. Thank you all for doing this. I give you, I think, Tony Riley first, right? I don't know if it's back. Can you hear me if I do this or shall I use this? This? Choose one. I'll, I'll do one. OK, I'll stay away from you. Uh, my job today is actually fairly simple. Uh, I'm basically to introduce our first speaker, Terry Davidson and provide some uh, historical and intellectual context for uh, the behavioral, uh, Center for Behavioral Neuroscience, uh, as well as its role in the 2030 initiative. Uh, I'm going to try to do that by giving you a little bit of a, uh, a trace, tracing the history of neuroscience in the scientific community, as well as talk a little bit about it in the public domain, as well as what it is, uh, has developed over uh, AU in the last 30 years or so. Um, although the term neuroscience may be New to some of us, uh, it's got a long history, uh, quite a long history. Uh, it's had its root in bio, roots in biology and, and uh, physical medicine. Uh, and you can trace some of this history by examining 1600s and 1700s where individuals were dissecting the brain to, to find the seat of the soul or looking at anatomical uh, damage and correlating with behavioral pathology. Uh, but the fact is it's got a long, long history and I'm gonna be talking about some recent history 
as we get into that. Um, a good definition of neuroscience is basically the scientific study of the nervous system. And it's got a number of practitioners, although initially physicians and biologists, it's now consists of uh, the representation is both psychologists and physiologists, biologists, uh, chemists, uh, I see a couple of chemists in the audience, uh, physicists, uh, modelers in computer science and mathematics, et cetera. Uh, it's truly a multidisciplinary field. Uh, I'm less interested in the fact that it's multidisciplinary than it's interdisciplinary because individuals from these uh, disciplines get together and do work all the time uh, and have representation in the field uh, looking at specific scientific phenomena. I'll just give you a couple of representations of that interdisciplinarity. Uh, you might find a mathematician, um, a physicist, an electrophysiologist, uh, uh, computer scientists all working together. Am I doing something wrong here? Could you use this one? It's easier oh. for Derek to hear. Okay. Can you hear me, Derek? It's important that Derek hears? Okay, I'll lean over here. Uh, we can look at uh, individuals like mathematicians, computer scientists, et cetera, who might be looking at cell assemblies or looking at uh, specific clusters of cells and trying to model uh, the normal functioning brain or the abnormal brain functionally to try to come up with ways uh, for therapeutic inter intervention or just simply the etiology of various types of diseases. We can look at things like neuro, not things, I sorry, apologize for that, I'm going to talk about chemists as being things. We can look at chemists, uh, neurochemists, uh, physiologists and molecular biologists who might be really interested in examining the uh, actual molecular makeup of the brain and trying to understand how it's penetrated or not penetrated by various types of chemicals that might be important for drug therapy, for our looking at uh, some mechanisms for uh, disease. We can also look at individuals like psychobiologists and biologists, a neuroendocrinologist and neurochemist as well, who might be really interested in looking at the neurochemistry of the brain, the languages of the brain, to try to understand normal and abnormal behavior and pathology. They are truly interdisciplinary. Now, I chose those three examples because they do represent behavioral neuroscience and neuros neuros behavioral neuroscience writ large. And these are the individuals that are truly interested in the biology of behavior, and that's exactly what Terry's going to be talking about as he describes the new Center for Behavioral Neuroscience. Now, what's interesting to me is some of the history of uh, the behavioral neuroscience that I've been describing. I put it into the scientific uh, side, but understand that it's also uh, relatively new in the field itself, although it's very old in terms of what's been done in the phenomena studies as well as some of the techniques. It wasn't until 1969 uh, that the Society for Neuroscience was formed. The Society for Neuroscience is the basic society, global society, international society that brings neuroscientists together to discuss work. In 1969, it was originated. In 1971, the first meeting was held here in Washington, D.C. I'm old enough to have come to that, and I'm really interested on the side that Scott talked about the new individuals that were just born today are going to be uh, the individuals taking advantage of the uh, 2030 initiative, and the new faculty here will be actually processing it. What on earth are the old faculty going to be doing, Scott? I, I assume we'll still be around. I hope so anyway. Uh, but in 1971, the first meeting was held here in Washington, D.C. It had 1,398 members uh, at attending that, that meeting. Uh, in the two tw 2012 meeting, which was down in New Orleans, there were 45,000 individuals. So it's really grown quite a bit over these years, and it truly is a society that's bringing everybody together. But it's not just a scientific domain which has importance for the neuroscience. I actually have a couple of quotes here. In uh, uh, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, in 1990, uh, the, the initiation was uh, a proclamation uh, by the President Bush on the decade of the brain. It was 1990 to two, uh, 2000. And in that proclamation here in, at the National Academy of Sciences, I, I was happy to be there, uh, 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 President Bush, although President Bush wasn't there, <laughs> even though it was his proclamation, his wife was there. And this was after they took everybody out of the room and they frisk us and they let us back into the room. Uh, but uh, uh, th through his wife, President Bush says, the human brain, a three pound mass of interwoven nerve cells that controls our activity, is one of the most magnificent and mysterious wonders of creation. The secret of human intelligence, interpreter of senses and controller of movement, this incredible organ continues to intrigue scientists and laymen alike. Now keep in mind in 1990 was also the initia initiation of the Human Genome Project, so lots was going on at this time and funding was increasing for the neurosciences. And shortly thereafter, in actually September 2000, uh, working through the American Psychological Association and also Congress, uh, introduced a decade, not of the brain, but decade of behavior. And the point of that uh, proclamation was to actually bring social scientists and natural scientists together to basically understand uh, behavior and its ramifications in the biology of behavior. In that proclamation, it was said, neuroscience is at a historic turning point. 
Today, a full decade after the decade of the brain, a continuous stream of advances is shattering long-held notions about the human brain, how it works, and what happened when it doesn't. These advances are also reshaping the landscape of other fields from psychology, economics, education, and the law. As a matter of fact, now you can look about anything and it's got neuro in front of it, uh, which gives it some credibility. Uh, most recently, in 2007, a number of individuals, neuroscientists across the world, met at George Mason University and introduced yet another decade. And this decade was starting in 2012 to 2022, which is the decade of the mind. Uh, so uh, lots of things are coming together in terms of uh, uh, bringing behavioral neuroscience uh, to the forefront. Now, what's interesting to me about that is that it's clearly p uh, promoting both investments and activities in neuroscience. Investments are in terms of training, time and money. And it's interesting, and President Obama in his uh, State of uh, the Union address several weeks ago indicated, today our scientists are mapping the human brain to unlock the answers to Alzheimer's and developing drugs to regenerate uh, uh, damaged organs. Now is not the time to gut these job creating investments in science and innovation. I uh, concur with Sarah that we, should need, we need to keep our funding up for all sorts of initiatives. Now the expanding field of neuroscience as reflected in these issues was actually paralleled uh, at the university itself. Uh, in 1999, literally 30 years after the uh, Society of Neurosciences was formed, uh, the Department of Psychology uh, actually initiated a behavioral neuroscience program. Uh, up to that point, the program had been experimental psychology, actually originated and, and created by Stan Weiss, who's in our audience. Uh, that uh, just shows how old Stan and I are. This was some time ago. Uh, and we changed the name of our program from experimental psychology, which for the last century had been the way uh, a psychologist had been trained and referred to uh, because the, number, the individuals who are applying to our program as faculty as well as the students who are applying were basically in this area. So the field had dramatically changed and we actually changed our name to bring in more neuroscience faculty and students into our program. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Stan was part of this as well, we changed it to another name. We were very fluid in psychology. Uh, we changed it to behavior cognition and neuroscience, uh, basically to encompass uh, all the individuals in our department, but also the interdisciplinary nature of the university. Uh, at that time, uh, the behavior cognition and neuroscience program was not just in psychology, as it is now, it's not as well, but we also brought in chemists. Uh, biologists, uh, mass, uh, mathematicians, uh, language and foreign studies, some physicists as well, to have an interdisciplinary program. And what was important about that event at that time was this is the first time that I could remember, I've been here a long time, uh, whereby we had scientists at the university working together on common projects. Uh, the the uh, dean at that time, uh, Kay Massell, uh, generated funds uh, through uh, the psychology department, which allowed us to fund PhD students in chemistry, which we did for Monica Konakleva, uh, Vicky Connaughton, Kathy Schaaf, uh, which allowed us to actually bring in st uh, students from other programs and faculty from other programs into a common, uh, basically a common intellectual directive uh, in, in the behavioral neurosciences. So it's really been a, a plus for us. Uh, soon after these things occurred, uh, Scott Bass came to AU, 2008, is that right, Scott? Um, I have that written in my mind. I have it in books everywhere. Uh, uh, Scott came, and what was interesting about Scott coming is that he immediately uh, initiated um, uh, further collaboration into disciplinarity. As a matter of fact, he pulled me aside at a strategic planning meeting. I remember this well. It scared the hell out of me. Uh, where Scott basically said, I want to create, a, I have a new program, a PhD program in psych. At that point, psychology had one PhD program with two tracks. Scott initiated as creating two PhD programs. One was behavior cognition and neuroscience. Uh, and what was interesting also about that is Scott initiated a series of interdisciplinary equipment grants, which a number of us took advantage of, which basically forced the issue of interdisciplinarity on campus among the sciences. It was one of the best things that ever happened to us. And shortly after that, with Scott, uh, Scott working with Peter Starr, uh, we now have gone to the second round of that equipment grant, uh, for, which are bridging the sciences, which basically is, been is being used now to fund uh, collaborative efforts in the new Center for Behavioral Neuroscience, which is what Tara will be describing in a second. Probably the most important thing that has happened in the last four or five, three or four years is the way we've hired faculty. And it's basically been a collaborative effort. As a matter of fact, when I go to science meetings, uh, science chairs meetings, uh, and I'm looking at Kathy here, uh, what is interesting about this is it's a team effort. Uh, the science uh, faculty and the science chairs on the campus are working together. And basically, any hires that come through the sciences are collateral now. 
Uh, we ask, how does this help any particular science program that has the position open, but also collaterally, how does it help other programs as well? This is a unique way that we've done this at AU, and it's certainly welcome. And I'll say this as a plug, just to keep Scott on top of this, and that is the commitment by the university uh, to create and fund a new science building has finally shown a commitment to the sciences on campus. I'm very happy that that's occurring and it will continue to occur. Nowhere, though, has been uh, the, the commitment to the sciences, natural sciences, life sciences, and neuroscience uh, been stronger, though, in, uh, than in a recent hire. And uh, as, as Peter said at the outset, uh, Scott and Peter and I got together uh, one afternoon, uh, maybe three years ago or so, and basically Scott said he wanted to bring an international leader to the university to head a behavioral neuroscience center. Uh, what this person's charge was going to be was to basically highlight the research on this campus to increase the visibility, both nationally and internationally, uh, the types of research that we were being done, to bring together faculty and students in collaborative efforts, and also to create a training program whereby we have a common endpoint of creating scientists in the, in the life sciences in general. Uh, we interviewed an unbelievably strong group of candidates for this, and these, they were all wonderful candidates. The one we hired was Terry Davison, and although Terry has been here is only for about a semester or so, he has already made headway into all those issues that we have set. He's truly an international star. Did I say that right, Terry? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to, to have had Terry come to the campus and really move us in the right direction. It's now my pleasure to introduce Terry, who's going to be talking about the Center for Behavioral Neuroscience and its role in the 2030 initiative. The title is The Environmental and Biological Basis of Cognitive Dementia. Terry. Uh, thank you uh, so much for uh, uh, inviting me to be here today and, and, and giving me this opportunity to talk, tell you about the center, and tell you about what I think um, uh, uh, 2030 will look like for American University. Um, I, I, I want to say that I may pay homage, I think, to Marco Rubio uh, a couple times during the talk. Um, but uh, um, I'll try not to be too distracting with that. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. Um, so Tony mentioned... Um, uh, uh, the international star, and we joked about that. But I think in order to have anybody be successful, uh, particularly in science, uh, you need hard work, that's for sure, and you need um, facilities, you need resources, and you need people around you uh, who are smart and can offer uh, their intellect and their skills uh, to the benefit of your project. That is, they're not people who are uh, confined to their own laboratories and their own small world. And um, I think that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Mm, let's see, there we go. Uh, with the Center for Behavioral uh, uh, Neuroscience at American University. Uh, it says here we're trying to establish a research and training foundation for 2030. And again, we're just getting off the ground. And our goals are, um, and Tony's kind of gone over some of these, we want to foster uh, multidisciplinary and integrated uh, research and training environment and multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary in terms that we look across different types of sciences to try to answer particular kinds of problems, particularly problems that have to do with the brain, the nervous system and how they impact on behavior. And that covers a, uh, a lot of territory. Um, we want to create a setting where we have faculty and students from different disciplines and we work to collaboratively, uh, collaboratively together um, and the basic idea is that we can learn more. Uh, we can uh, understand things from different perspectives, come up with novel ideas and novel discoveries uh, when we start looking at uh, things from uh, the uh, framework of different disciplines. And uh, this will allow us also to produce new synergies, but not only intellectual, conceptual synergies, but also economies that uh, will uh, increase the breadth and scope of our research and promote the uh, 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 efficient use of resources. And we'll Science is a very expensive prop proposition, and it gets more and more expensive all the time. And so uh, it would be great if we didn't have to have a confocal microscope in each person's laboratory, or we didn't have to have a nuclear magnetic resonance imaging machine in every laboratory that could use it. And so the concept here is that we want to be able to produce uh, core facilities where a number of people can have access to state-of-the-art equipment that uh, will allow them to do their research and be competitive. Uh, with anybody else in, in the field. Um, and of course, the thing we always have to keep in mind 
is that we're not here just to uh, do bench science. We're not here just to explore uh, neurons or the brain. We actually want to solve problems. And we want to create knowledge that are going to improve the quality of life. And that's what scientists sh should do. And that's what we hope to keep uh, in the forefront of the center. Uh, the basic conceptualization of the center now, and this kind of gives you a little bit of, of a, a, a flavor of the integrative nature of it. Uh, we want to have the center as a hub of research excellence in a number of different things that are related to behavioral neuroscience. Uh, we have people in the center who study cognitive and sensory processes. So if you've seen Art Shapiro, you've seen the illusions. Uh, well, there's much more to that than interesting illusions. There's a real, um, how should I say, understanding, and at least in, in a striving to understand, how the visual cortex works and how the visual system processes information and how, uh, just last week, Art and I were part of a, a panel session on neuroesthetics. And that is how we see beauty and what part of the brain are involved in, in beauty. This was at the Cats and Art Center. Uh, these are, when we call, talk about sensations, so it's clearly eyes, ears, and so on, but uh, it also requires memory, and it requires, uh, um, how should I say, synergies, putting information together, using things symbolically. Well, the brain is involved in all this stuff, and, and one of the things you want to do is understand how the brain does it. Behavioral excess is an area where... Um, um, well, I'll be talking about that today. Uh, Tony didn't mention too much about his research, but his research is in drug addiction and uh, in drugs of abuse. There's a lot of behavioral excess in, in those kinds of things. Behavioral excess can extend to, uh, to um, I mean, smoking can be looked at as an example of behavioral excess. Or, uh, you know, maybe some people you know exercise too much, right? I mean, uh, maybe exercise, uh, you know, there's a lot of, it's all relative, of course. But the thing is, anything you do that, to excess, and, and excess means it can have a, a, a maladaptive or a, a, a bad consequence for you. Well, that would be a, a, a thing of interest to the center. And the brain, of course, is very importantly involved in these things. This relates to emotional health. We, so we have a number of faculty, and they're not just confined to each of these quadrants. Some of them cross the quadrants. Uh, emotional health would be your ability to think you can deal with what confronts you. Right? Some people, um, depression might be an example where you just think you can't do it. Other people, just having the confidence that you can do it really makes life easier. Well, we have folks uh, uh, in the center who are studying emotional health and they're looking at brain substrates of emotional health. Uh, I think uh, Sarah talked about uh, putting an implant into the brain, uh, area 25, which uh, may uh, help uh, relieve depression. Well, that's, there's a behavioral neuroscientist behind that, that research. Um, Modulation of structure function relations. Sometimes that's what you think of as the, the wet science part of, of, you know, you got a guy sitting at a bench with a, you know, a tissue culture, a cell culture. Um, well, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, it involves understanding hormones, neurotransmitters, whole circuits. I mean, the brain is a uh, remarkable system in terms of its, its complexity of the circuits. And we would like to break that down. And we want to know the kinds of things that modulate the activation of various kinds of structures and how that modulation uh, impacts on the function that we're studying. Could be learning, could be memory, could be motivation, could be uh, language. Right. Uh, basically what I did is I sent out some emails and uh, early, uh, earlier last semester, and I wanted to see who was interested in being in the center. And we had um, quite a response. Not everyone responded, <coughs> but uh, <laughs> we had quite a response to, uh, to this uh, email. And what you'll see here are people uh, in really diverse uh, disciplines. And so clearly we have a number of psychologists in the disciplines. And in psychology itself, we have clinical psychologists as well as people who study behavior in the nervous system. Uh, we have biologists. We have people from math and stat who study computational models. We have folks in, um, uh, well, performing arts. I see Naomi back there, and uh, she gave a nice uh, presentation at our, at our uh, retreat, World Language and Cultures. Uh, we have folks that are interested in, uh, in the brain and interested in um, uh, how the brain reacts uh, and influences behavior from a number of different dimensions and levels of analysis. Uh, these folks, uh, will, in order for them to do their jobs and to, um, to be more successful, we need to develop the intellectual resources that are available to them and, uh, and to the university in general. So a very simple thing that we've started, <coughs> but I think it's been <coughs> quite successful, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is the Center for Behavioral Neuroscience uh, Journal Club. <coughs> and uh, I, 
<coughs> this would have happened to Marco Rubio. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> the Center for Behavior Neuroscience Journal Club. I'm going to just keep talking through this. It'll get better. And uh, <coughs> mostly what this is, is we have uh, all the students, in it, and we certainly can have faculty members as well, will come in, pick papers that are of interest to them, and they're topical papers. Thank you very much. And, uh, <coughs> and all we do is discuss, discuss them. And so what we have are people from different disciplines, different uh, backgrounds, uh, trying to learn about each other's type of work. The annual uh, center for retreat, the purpose here is for, to, to allow the membership to basically present their research findings, their hot ideas, the things that they're excited about. And the idea would be to emphasize uh, potential points of collaboration, overlap. And so I was really pleased at the turnout. This was on a Saturday afternoon, took all day. We had people uh, at this uh, retreat who got there at 7 o'clock in the morning and didn't leave till 6 o'clock at night. And uh, uh, there were, I've, I've heard a number of issues um, from a number of different people where there's uh, issues where people have found uh, collaborative uh, places to collaborate on and, and uh, some, perhaps some scientific collaborations will come out. This is just the kind of thing that, that we want to have uh, the center do. Uh, some things that are planned, uh, there's special lectures in behavioral neuroscience where we're going to bring in people from outside. Uh, <coughs> and these will be people who are either younger folks who are movers and shakers, have really kind of interesting ideas, or folks who uh, are more established and have uh, been, had a bigger influence in the field for a while. And they're going to come in and uh, they're going to send reading lists to our students. Uh, the students will read those lists for a couple weeks. They'll have, be a, phil a facilitator like me or perhaps other faculty members. And then uh, the people will come in for a couple days and lead the class. Um, I think uh, the American University Symposium for Behavioral Neuroscience. I think this is an important thing. One of the things that we'd like to do, I think, is raise the visibility of science. And we're going to use the center to try to raise the visibility of science at American University. And what this symposium will do, we'll pick a topic in behavioral neuroscience. Uh, let's just say obesity. I don't know why I would think of that one. But uh, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's uh, say we did a uh, topic. But it could be any topic. And um, the idea is, is that we're going to bring in, uh, just for a day or two, uh, maybe 10 people who are outstanding people in the field, experts in this. And not only that, though, we don't want to have a symposium where basically we all sit around and watch 10 experts talk. We have experts here as well. And we're going to integrate those experts within the symposium. And so the people who come here then are going to come away from AU knowing what we have here as well as we knowing what they, what they do. And uh, the goal of this thing, and I've done this a couple times at other places, and I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic I can do it again, is to get the proceedings of the symposium published in a peer-reviewed international journal. So the last one um, that I was involved with was published in Physiology and Behavior, which is an international journal in neuroscience. And um, it, it, we published as the uh, American University Symposium or the proceedings of the American University Symposium on whatever the topic will be. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, you not only have to develop intellectual resources, but you need to develop core resources. And, uh, so Tony pointed out that there had been a lot of uh, groundwork laid. And so for me to come in and uh, try to get some of these things off the ground was, was relatively easy. And there's tremendous support I've had from the dean, from Tony, and from the provost. Uh, these are some of the things that are currently available, and some are new, some have been here for a while. Uh, Tony mentioned these grants that have, that, that have helped uh, upgrade the equipment and facilities here. Uh, these are, uh, some of them are really state-of-the-art in the sense that they're not found in every lab. Some of the stuff you have to have, they're just basic kinds of equipment, and they're all important to do the job that we want to do. So uh, the analytical core is going to measure things like neurotransmitters and toxins and drugs that are in tissue and brain. The surgical core will allow us to manipulate brain and nervous system in particular ways, uh, which, and then test those effects on behavior. And then uh, we have a small animal nuclear magnetic resonant imaging. As you know, um, if you've ever been in one of those things, they're not very small, they're big. They usually cost millions of dollars. Fortunately, when you put a rat or a mouse in them, they're not a million dollars because they're not quite as big. They're still expensive, right? But they really help us do a lot in terms of understanding um, what the composition of the animal's body is uh, and what the animal, uh, how should I say, uh, the function of the nervous system is in controlling that body composition. Oh, OK, maybe. Can, can you hear me? I, I think I was uh, um, OK. OK, good. Uh, these are new core facilities that are coming uh, for the center. Uh, core facility for confocal microscopy. Uh, these microscopes are, um, they're our state of the art. 
And the fact of the matter is you, they, they give you 3D uh, uh, detailed pictures of neurons and cells. And um, to be competitive in neuroscience these days, you have to have scientists who do this. And we're now, um, actually the, the, the microscope arrived a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it will be set up, it needs a special room, uh, and, but we'll have this capability here. And this will also help us attract other scientists, uh, scientists here in the future. Um, a core facility for optogenetic interrogation of cells. This is brand new. You can actually turn on a cell by flashing a light on it, in a brain cell. You can turn off circuits in the brain, turn them on and turn them off by fla flashing a laser on it. Uh, this is what this thing does, and so you can understand what the function of that part of the brain is when you turn it off and on and look at what the animal's behavior is. So this is a freely moving animal. You can also, we have a, a core facility for cognitive neuroscience. Cognitive neuroscience is people studying memory and brain function, and uh, you can look at the activation, electrical activity in the brain, and using an electroencephalograph and other uh, devices, we didn't have these kinds of setup. These are basic equipment for cognitive neuroscience, and now we'll be able to do these things at the center. Um, for AU2030, so with, with this kind of foundation, I see us developing a, what I'm calling a multidisciplinary, multi-level approach to solving problems and improving the quality of life. And um, it's a multi-level analysis. I mean, we can do things at the molecular level. So this is a uh, 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 inside a cell. What are the parts of the cell, how it's working? We can then look at hormones, neurons, neurotransmitters that act on that, those cells. We can look at the brain structures and circuits. So how neurons are composing uh, lots of different parts of the brain, and I'm going to be talking about some of those parts and how they're related to things that might be important to you coming up here. And those brains and circuits and structure, brain circuits and structures, uh, they control the behavioral and mental function. Those four things, um, any problem you look at in, in, in uh, behavior or brain or psychology, um, whether it be obesity, cognitive dementia, uh, sensation, you can study at each of those levels of analysis. And each of those levels will have models. There are people who have theoretical models. Right now we're interviewing people who are computational neuroscientists. So they have mathematical models at each level of, of, these, these, uh, of, of an analysis. And, um, so you can have different types of behavioral models, animal models, all kinds of different kinds of things at each level to try to figure out how they work. Typically, you don't find people who work across all the levels at the same time, right? You have to have different individuals and different scientists who work at each level. And then when you really make progress is where you, those scientists talk to each other, okay? So that again brings these people into the center and the idea is that we'll talk to those folks. And we have a number of these folks on, on campus now and uh, we're considering uh, bringing, trying to bring in some others. The last thing up there is really kind of outside the realm of behavioral neuroscience. Uh, it's what we want to do is, I mentioned we want to solve problems. And this is, we want to form social and policy change. I was at a talk um, last fall, and the president of, um, of Syracuse University was there. And, and this is a paraphrase. I didn't, you know, I just listened to her talk, but this was the gist of it. And she said, unless we can translate scientific discoveries into action, Rather than so uh, solving society's problems, all we're going to do is continue to live off them. So we get a lot of grant money, right? And uh, one of the things we want to do with this grant money is tr we want to make discoveries on the bench. But the point is, it's not just discoveries on the bench. We want to be able to translate those discoveries on the bench to some kind of action that's going to improve the quality of life and improve our society. And that's one of the things that seems to be a strength at AU, is there are people here who are, know a lot about policy, there are people here that know a lot about uh, trying to institute social change. And it might be possible, and this is a, you know, not something that will begin tomorrow, but it, it, a goal of mine would be, is to try to take stuff in the laboratory, and I'll talk about some of the things I think we really need to translate from the laboratory into, uh, into uh, social and, and, and policy change uh, that will help uh, solve problems for us and some major ones. All right, so uh, what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to move away from the center and I'm going to talk about a model uh, that uh, AU for AU2030. And the model I'm going to talk about doesn't mean it's, it's not like it's the perfect thing. It's just a model of one way of, of approaching something. And it's the one I'm most familiar with, so that's why I'll talk about it. And it's one that I'm going to uh, exploit here. But there could be other models that, that do this uh, type of thing and also build the behavioral neurosciences. Um, so one of the things I see that it, for, for if you want to look and read the tea leaves, right, and that's kind of what we're doing when we try to project uh, what's going to be important uh, in 2030, 
is you want to identify national and global research priorities. And um, one place to start is a current threat, and then what's the prognosis for that threat in the future? And so two things that are current threats to human health and welfare are obesity. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk about the current scope of that problem, and I'm going to talk about projections for 2030 and beyond, and Alzheimer's disease and cognitive dementias. They may seem to be un unrelated types of things, but what I'm going to try to convince you today is they're not so unrelated. And matter of fact, there could be a big storm coming up. And uh, uh, based on our inability to control obesity, which then may cause us to have a problem with uh, cognitive dementias later on. So uh, looking at global threats, priorities. I thought this was a, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to explain this very much. You know we have a big problem in this country uh, with um, overeating and over obesity. And projections are that um, some of the problems that we think are really dangerous. Global warming, clearly dangerous. There's uh, flu, flu ep epidemics, um, very uh, potentially dangerous. Lots of types of things. This one could surmount, surpass all those. So if we look at uh, some key facts, and these are recently from the World Health Organization, uh, obesity has doubled worldwide since 1980. Uh, there's billions of people uh, who are suffering from uh, overweight, and millions, hundreds of millions of people are suffering from obesity. The difference, uh, overweight, anything basically less than about 30 pounds. So if you're a five foot six woman, and you weigh 30 pounds more than, uh, uh, what's called a normal weight, you're obese. And if you fall in the range of, say, 10 to uh, 30 pounds, you're going to be in the overweight range. The biggest growing area is obesity, right? And uh, we've had our influx of overweight, and now a lot of those folks are becoming obese. An interesting statistic was that we used to be worried, and there's still reason to be worried about malnutrition, but the next statistic is if you look at the world's population, more people are dying of overnutrition than they are of malnutrition in the world today, right? More people are dying of overnutrition than malnutrition. And perhaps worse yet is that it's hitting our youngest members of our society. Kids, children, school-age kids, preschool-age kids uh, are becoming overweight. 40 million children under the age of, 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 uh, of five are overweight in 2010. What's the problem, right? It used to be that being overweight, well, that's, you know, we're jolly or whatever, it's not a problem. There are all kinds of comorbidities associated with uh, this obesity. Uh, depression, uh, lots of different kinds of diseases, asthma, multiple sclerosis, cancer, uh, clearly diabetes, 50% of the people who have, are, are obese have uh, diabetic problems, high blood pressure, heart failure. These are all comorbidities, causes of death that are independent of, of, of uh, the death by obesity, but obesity is a contributory factor. And then dementia. Uh, dementia, people who are uh, uh, overweight and obese, uh, obese are likely, 30% more likely to suffer from dementia. If we look at the prevalence, and here's some projections, so you can see a trend here uh, from uh, the early 60s, and then there was kind of a spike in increase during the, from the 80s to the 2000. By uh, 2030, it looks like we're going to be about 50% more obese than we were, uh, are today, and looking all the way out to, uh, what is that? Uh, you know, I guess that is only 2030 in this one. Uh, as you can see, the, the likelihood of, of, of uh, uh, or the projections for obesity in adults is, is uh, well, it, it's not very uh, pleasant looking. One out of six children are obese now. And if you look at uh, the statistics for kids as well, what you're seeing is a linear increasing function. That is, kids in various age groups, 6 to 11 and adolescents, over the last uh, 30 years or so, it's been a market increase in the number of kids who are obese. The problem with this is, is that of those kids who are obese, there's a 70% chance of them becoming um, uh, overweight as adults. So the problem starts in childhood. It doesn't go away. It's not baby fat. Uh, is there uh, a threat? Uh, well, um, if you look at the top line, that shows what the estimated cost of obesity will be and it goes out to 2030 uh, if nothing happens. If we can get a 5% reduction 
in BMI. That's a measure of obesity. Uh, it's the bottom line. You'll see that we dramatically reduce the cost. It's less effective. The middle line is a 1% reduction. And uh, again, so there's economic costs here that are associated with disease, not just uh, health uh, costs in terms of individuals. All right. Now let me switch gears a little bit, but I think I'll tie it back to obesity in a moment. Let's take a look at Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and I, I, uh, um, I sometimes have joked that by 2030, um, many of us will not even remember the obesity crisis. And one of the reasons we're not going to remember it is because there's a looming Alzheimer epidemic as well. Key facts from the World Health Organization. All right, so this is, these are the things that, that tell you how terrible the disease is. And, and we've had, um, I think, almost all of us, no people have suffered from this disorder. And so it's not like I need to tell you these things. There are things that are, um, I mean, maybe you didn't know that it's the sixth leading cause of death in this country, of all causes. Uh, the, the, uh, probably you, you might not have known that um, really the major cause of disability in later life is Alzheimer's disease. And one of the big problems is with Alzheimer's disease, unlike obesity, is it's not just the victim of Alzheimer's, but their caregivers and their families that affect, are affected. So obesity, people, people who are obese can take care of themselves. They may have a shorter life, they may have less healthy life, they may have le less quality in their lives, but generally they can take care of themselves. People with suffering from Alzheimer's can't do that, and it's expensive, they have to have someone care for them. Um, here's the projected increase of uh, in, uh, Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's-like cognitive dementias. And I say Alzheimer's-like cognitive dementias because in many cases, we can't tell if a person has Alzheimer's disease or not until post-mortem. But we can tell that they have real serious memory deficits and cognitive deficits. Sometimes it's not the characteristic Alzheimer's disease. Well, if you look here, you'll see the projections. It's going to go up by about 50% by 2030 from now. And it's going to over double as a projection by 2050. Okay. If you look at the costs, um, it's going to be a trillion dollars by 2050. Uh, at, the, at, at the present time, we're looking at these are just costs in billions of dollars, right? So, cost of, of, of Alzheimer's disease is over 200 billion. Um, it's expected to double by 2030. And um, again, over 20 trillion, which is more than the national debt. Uh, are they going to be the cost of Alzheimer's disease uh, by 2050. The current rate of money that's being spent on Alzheimer's disease for research, 100 bucks for every 25,000 uh, in terms of care, $100 for research in terms of care. Um, the sequestration, yeah, there's another thing. We have a grant that's uh, rather a large grant that um, is uh, in sequestration limbo as well. And uh, our grant, I'll describe some of the work we do and then try to also link it to the general overall um, um, uh, framework of building science at AU in a moment. I mean, you'll see the kind of stuff we do. This is a brain, and it's normal in every way except somebody decided to cut it in half. And uh, what you'll see in this brain, well, it, it points this, uh, this little area here is called the hippocampus. And this is a kind of a structure circuit that's, that's involved with the hippocampus. But this little area here turns out to be quite important. This is the cortex up here, of course, if you're not real familiar with brain anatomy. This is an area where a lot of decision processes, the frontal cortex. Uh, as we get back further in the brain, this is the visual cortex and so on. And they're not showing much of the cerebellum that controls motor movement. But this particular part of the brain, this, this um, kind of I keep hitting the wrong one. There we go. This uh, particular uh, area is actually a kind of discrete structure. It does particular kinds of functions. I'll talk about that in a second. If we look at the pathology of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease, on your uh, left you see this is actually a, 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 a brain from early stage. This is what they're thinking is early stage. So it's preclinical. But this person probably wasn't showing uh, any signs of, of cognitive deficit. If you look at uh, the severe Alzheimer's brain, you see a big difference. And one of the differences you see, these areas in here are ventricles. They're greatly enlarged, and that's because the brain is atrophied, right, and it's shrunk. And this area, this is the, now the brain has been cut in this angle, or kind of across the front, this way. And this is that hippocampal area I pointed out. Here it is in, a, in the pretty much normal brain, and over here, it's basically shrunk and has holes in it, and it, it's not working very well. Okay, so we, now we look at the progression of the disease. 
And um, so we're looking at the pathology and where the pathology is. I'm not even really talk much about what the pathology is at the, right now, but take a look at, at where the pathology begins. So we start up here. This is no symptoms. Uh, so this area, there we go. And here, this is the hippocampus again. The medial temporal lobe is the kind of memory center uh, surrounding the hippocampus. About 16 years later, uh, you might look at the brain and, and, and what you might find is some uh, damage, some pathology in the hippocampal formation. 27 years later, there's no obvious symptoms. People who have this kind of pathology can usually cover it up. All right, they can use strings, oops, strings on their finger or notes or have calendars like I have so I can remember to come to meetings and things like that. And if I don't put it in there, I don't remember anymore. But uh, at any rate, uh, you can cover that kind of thing up. Uh, down here is where you start seeing impairments that aren't so easy to cover up, okay? And um, it's a lot of people, when they hear a talk like this, they, well, most of us think, you know, we have memory lapses all the time. Um, these are probably not disease states, right, just because you have a memory lapse. Uh, a memory lapse here, uh, it, it's, it's like um, a mild cognitive impairment. Maybe you forget um, the name of a neighbor or a faculty co colleague, right? And you forget this kind of thing. Now, again, I don't want to cause alarm because we're going to do that once in a while anyway, right? But if this is a, 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 a common thing, those are the kinds of things that are mild cognitive impairments. You just, and again, for the most part, uh, it, you can function perfectly. What happens, though, if you notice, is the area of the brain that's showing pathology is surrounding this hippocampal area. And by the time you have full-blown dementia, what you can see is the pathology is strongest in the hippocampal area. But it's also extended into the brain areas where decision-making processes are made, um, other kinds of cognitive functions. Okay, so you got this uh, uh, pathology. What this means is, is that you can see changes in brain that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, which happen decades before the symptoms show up. And so if you look at this thing uh, along the bottom, this one's showing that uh, brain changes begin to occur in early adulthood or adolescence. We actually think they begin to occur in childhood. Right? We actually think that they begin to occur in childhood. And if we can show this, uh, one of the nice things about it is, well, first off, you have to understand what the changes are. You have to understand what causes them then perhaps what you can do is stop them early on. By the time you get to that last brain that I just showed you, you're not gonna change anything, right? The brain is fairly well damaged, okay? Now, what you're seeing here is the development, and, and this is tied to age. Uh, these early uh, processes, again, people can function okay, you don't see it. Then in real Alzheimer's disease and cognitive dementia, that's where you start seeing around 70 years old, 75 years old, you start seeing an accelerated increase in, in problems with memory and, and, and uh, ability just to, to uh, live a normal life. And uh, you'll notice a normal person, non-disease state, we're gonna have memory deficit as we get older, uh, but nothing like the disease state. Okay, so why interest in this area of the brain called the hippocampus? So you probably already guessed it's a well-established brain substrate for uh, a very m number of different types of memory functions. Um, it's also an early target for brain damage that's produced by lack of oxygen, lack of blood supply, toxins, and so on. So it's the part, if, if you uh, had, um, um, uh, let's say if you, we denied uh, oxygen to your brain, it's the part where, where you first see um, uh, damage. Sometimes people refer to it as the canary in the coal mine. Right? It's the thing that's most sensitive. It's not a good design. Right? You lose your cognitive ability first, but I would put that in the suggestion box. Uh, memory failures uh, uh, that you see, now sometimes what people talk about is just amnesia. Well, people have amnesias. Well, there's particular types of memory failures, and these particular types of memory failures are produced um, how should I say, uh, by um, a lack of, of, of uh, uh, by interference, let's put it this way. If you try to remember something, so I try to get you to remember uh, your second grade teacher's name, or I try to get you to remember what you had for lunch yesterday, well, chances are maybe what you had for lunch today could interfere with that memory, or what you had for lunch the two days before. If I ask you about that second grade teacher, maybe the third grade teacher's name, or you know, who the scoutmaster was, or whatever kinds of adults were around, well, in order to remember stuff, what that means is we have to suppress other memories. We've got to get the, the unwanted stuff out of the way. Hippocampus is uh, involved in that particular kind of process. So it, it will help reduce interference from competing items, so intrusions of things that don't belong there, perseverating on things that, you know, that aren't important at the time. 
And this is called impaired memory inhibition. Brain imaging studies report changes in hippocampal activation specific to these inhibitory processes occur. So the hippocampus is involved in this memory inhibition, uh, inhibition process. Now the perfect storm. So this is, uh, these were taken from two different sources. And so you can go to the literature on uh, cognitive dementias and Alzheimer's disease. Typically, it's a whole different set of people that are doing research in that area. And you compare that, it's changing now. We're getting more people interested in both these things as, as they might be interrelated. And you look at, the, at folks who study um, overeating and, and obesity, and they, you know, they, they, they have, they're kind of by themselves also. Well, one of the things is if you look at what the consequences of eating a high-energy diet, and when I say high-energy diet, I mean the diet that most of us eat. It's called the Western diet as well. Lots of saturated fat, lots of carbohydrates and sugars. What happens is, is that uh, you get uh, all these symptoms, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and so on. The same uh, different group of people, well, if you notice, the symptoms are the same here. Again, there are some symptoms on both lists that are independent of the other list, but these are a lot of overlapping symptoms. They call those treatable, preventable risk factors in AD. The problem is, of course, is that the people who study obesity don't know how to treat them. We don't know how to stop people from eating. We don't know how to stop. The, the idea is stopping them. Everyone knows that less energy, energy in, you, you reduce your energy in, you increase your energy expenditure, no weight gain. How do you do that? How do you get people to do it? It's not easy to be done. All right, these are correlational findings linking obesity to cognitive decline. The first one is basically says, if you're fat in midlife, you have central obesity in midlife, yeah, I know people covering their faces, uh, right, if you, if you have obesity in midlife, your uh, likelihood, incidence of having cognitive dementia later in life uh, goes up. Um, if, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, there are physiological changes that are common to both obesity and diabetes. I'm going to talk about some of those that seem to promote Alzheimer's disease. And the one at the bottom here talks about studies of obesity and cognition in children, adolescents, and adults and shows that obesity is uh, uh, positively associated with cognitive deficits. Now, not necessarily, we're not calling kids who are obese, they don't have Alzheimer's disease, but there's evidence that they have cognitive deficits. And I, I think the cognitive deficits they have are these memory inhibition things I just mentioned. So those are correlational data. And as you know, correlations can be interpreted a lot of ways. So um, just for example, uh, I came from Indiana, in, in Indiana, um, I, there was a movement to try to um, make it, you had to be 18, I think it was 21, to buy hot chocolate. And the main reason is, is that hot chocolate consumption was associated, the more hot chocolate was consumed, the greater number of traffic accidents there were, All right? And so, I, you know, in order to curb um, traffic accidents, we should make it only adults, you know, we don't want kids driving around drinking hot chocolate. Obviously, correlation means, those are perfect correlation, but a correlation doesn't mean anything about causation. There could be a third variable like slippery roads, weather, those, those kinds of things. So what we want to do then, we don't want to look at just correlations. We want to be able to look at are there causal relationships? Can we provide some evidence for cause? Influence of Western diet. Western diet is the thing that uh, we, most of us eat. Hamburgers and so on are, are, are typical of Western diet. Lots of saturated fat, have lots of, of, of sugars. If we eat Western diet, we'll be like these rats. So the top thing is a, you can see the Western diet from a rat. Uh, we have a chow here. What happens with the Western diet is uh, rats will gain weight and, um, compared to a standard chow diet. What also happens to these same rats is they start showing cognitive impairment. Okay? What this shows you is this is a task over here that doesn't require the hippocampus. So there are some tasks. Hippocampus is involved in all kinds of memory. Some tasks require the hippocampus. The one on the left is one that doesn't require the hippocampus. And you notice HE is the high energy diet. And um, uh, where'd it go? There it is. HE is the high energy diet. These guys are discriminating very well in a simple discrimination task. So this trial is rewarded. This one's non rewarded. They have to know, don't respond on the, on the non rewarded trial. Over here, this is a hippocampal dependent task, and it's a little bit different in that they have to learn to respond to a stimulus that had been reinforced before. So these are food that are given to these animals. And so when a tone comes on uh, and by itself, the animal gets uh, food, and when a light uh, precedes the tone, uh, they don't get food. So they have to learn to inhibit responding to the tone. Well, if I destroy the hippocampus with the surgical manipulation, animals have difficulty solving that problem. Well, one of the things you can see here, this is the, these are animals on a high energy diet, and they're impaired in solving that problem compared to animals that are on a regular chow diet. 
So we're producing a def deficit in the hippocampal ability to solve a cognitive problem in these rats. What is causing this kind of thing? Well, one of the things that we do is we measure the blood-brain barrier. So Peter mentioned we study blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier is uh, ba basically a, a network that prevents things from getting to the brain that normally wouldn't get in there. Um, toxins and certain kinds of hormones. Uh, and it's a tighter and tighter set of capillaries, pretty much, is what happens. And it's controlled by genes. Well, if we reduce the expression of those genes, the blood-brain barrier gets weaker. You give an animal a high-fat diet, and what these data show, the dark bars are a high-fat diet, and there are a number of genes that control the strength of the blood-brain barrier, uh, this one, this one, and this one, that are uh, reduced in their expression. What happens when we then test the blood-brain barrier by itself, we see what's crossing into the brain, in particular this area of the brain that's um, involved with the memory, the hippocampus. What you can see is the animals, and these are the same animals that show this cognitive deficit, they respond more, I should say, show more bad stuff, exogenous stuff. In this case, it's just dye, it's a small molecule dye that's crossing into the blood-brain barrier. Other areas of the brain are not as effective as much. This is controlled, but uh, this is compared to a controlled diet. So what things cross into the brain? things that don't belong there, they produce problems. And one of the problems that they produce is inflammation. Inflammation is happening in the hippocampus in animals that have uh, the high-fat diets. What you're seeing here, whoop, I'll get back to that guy in a second. What you're seeing here is uh, these are males and females, and both are showing greater inflammation. These are animals that have been on a high-fat diet. They're showing greater inflammation in this memory brain area. Over here, what you're seeing is microglia. Microglia basically show up when there's damage to uh, uh, neural tissue. And so what you're seeing here, and I'll just point out these two, this is an animal that's been on a high-fat diet. This is chow. Microglia, the number of microglia are indicated by the number of black dots in here. And what you can see is a lot more black dots there than you can see here, and that's basically what's being shown in this diagram below. One of the things that uh, uh, some of us are going to luck out and some of us won't be so lucky is that um, like uh, humans, rats, some rats you give them a high fat diet, this western diet, and they don't gain very much weight. There are humans like that as well, right? You can give them this diet and they just don't, don't gain very much weight. So one of the things we were interested in was do they also, is there a difference in terms of the rats that gain weight and don't on the diet in terms of their cognitive function and also in terms of the damage that's happening to their blood brain barrier? And what you'll see here is um, the far end over here. So this is a simple problem, this problem in this area. This is a simple problem I showed you before and the one that doesn't depend on, upon the hippocampus. And it doesn't make a difference if they're diet-induced obese, that's what DIO means, or if they're diet-resistant, they don't get fat, or if they're on child controls. They're, they solve this problem fine. What happens is, notice over here, this is the group that was obese. This is the uh, group that was on the diet that was not. There's no difference between this group and a child control. This group is, is impaired. They can't solve the problem, right? Here's the body weights. You can see that there's really no difference in body weight among, not a significant difference in body weight among the animals that are diet resistant and child controls. The animals that are on a high fat diet, they're uh, uh, showing a big uh, um, uh, increase in body weight. Well, we're also seeing changes in blood brain barrier. Only the animals that gained a lot of weight show impaired blood brain barrier whereas the guys who are on the diet that resisted weight gain uh, don't show the blood-brain barrier impairment. And the, oh, I should have pressed that, I guess, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to go through this very quickly because I know my time is, is running out. This uh, is leading us to some uh, conclusions about other factors that could be uh, damaging the brain and could also produce... Um, uh, cognitive impairment late in life. So we, we looked at high-fat diet. We're saying high-fat diet damages blood-brain barrier. When you damage the blood-brain barrier, what's happening is you're allowing stuff into the brain that shouldn't get in there. It's producing inflammation, microglia, and it could be the basis of the plaques and, 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 and neurofibrillatory tangles that characterize Alzheimer's disease, right? And they start early on, okay? And this is a progressive deterioration buildup. What if we took some really toxic kind of thing, a big dose of methamphetamine, Right? And, and so Tony and I are interested in looking at this thing. It's a highly addictive, so you're going to get a lot of behavioral excess, just like you get behavioral excess in obesity. What happens? We don't know what happens behaviorally, but there are data out there that show what happens to the brain. These are the tight junction proteins I mentioned before. 
Uh, and what happens, that's the animals on the high fat diet. Down here are animals that have been injected with a massive dose, a single dose of amphetamine. And one of the things you see, well, there's not much, this, this the hippocampus we're looking at, there's not much in terms of this uh, uh, ZO1, uh, pro, this, that particular gene. But notice that that uh, uh, so clutin and, and clonidin, the, the two genes at the end, uh, those actually produce, uh, re the, the methamphetamine has basically the same kind of effect as the Western diet does on the expression of those genes. Okay, if we look at um, dye accumulating, so this, these folks use some dye as well, same kind of technique we did, and what you'll see is that it's accumulating specifically in the hippocampus and these animals that have been given methamphetamine, and uh, that's what happened to animals that had been on the high-fat diet. Uh, if you look at um, uh, an inflammation, these areas, this right here, this is just a thing that was known to, uh, this is a chemical that's known to produce inflammation. This is the methamphetamine. We're getting excess inflammation in animals, and these are, these are particular kinds of markers for inflammation. It's the same effect, and those, those markers for inflammation in a methamphetamine as we were seeing in the high-fat diet. And this is microglia, and I think the thing to look at here is this, they just did a different measure of their microglia. Over here, they have uh, all, all these white uh, little uh, characters and uh, splotches up here, they indicate uh, that's microglia built up. Notice that methamphetamine produces a buildup of microglia, as, and that's also what you see in a high-fat diet. So there's a lot of similarities between those two things, and one is, uh, as you know, very harmful and illegal, and the other one, well, is not, and we can eat as much of it as we want. All right. So the summary here is, is that we have reduced expression of tight junction protein genes in the BBB, increased permeability, leaky blood-brain barrier. We have a selective accumulation of exogenous agents. Now, this is dye, but it could be anything that's crossing that blood-brain barrier. It doesn't have to be just dye. Um, it's, uh, we get increased inflammation and buildup of microglia indicating damage. Okay, what does this mean in terms of positioning AU? Right? Well, one thing for sure is that um, if we do research, and this, again, this is a model system, and I think that we could do research in this area, both obesity and cognitive dementia are currently very dangerous threats to health and human welfare, and they're exposed, uh, expected to increase by 2030. Um, we need to elucidate the relationship. There's lots of questions here. Uh, we, know, we need to know uh, uh, what diets and other kinds of factors uh, interfere with blood-brain barrier integrity, uh, how they produce uh, hippocampopathology, and we need to do this before we can understand uh, ways that uh, um, uh, the etiology of these, these disorders, cognitive decline, obesity, other forms of behavioral excess. Uh, we also need to understand how these things work so we can develop effective uh, therapies. Uh, and we need to evaluate the relationships between childhood obesity, impaired hippocampal dependent memory function, academic performance, and cognitive function later in life. And so I've already actually I'd mentioned, uh, I talked with Stacy Snelling, we've had conversations with Stacy Snelling and Sarah Belsom. They have, um, uh, have access and interest in obviously cognitive functioning in kids, and they have access to a large population. And we are just in the beginning stages of talking about a potential collaborative project where we take the ideas from the bench and take a look and see if they're operating in, in the school children that they, they're uh, most interested in. And then again, this is kind of related to that. We want to develop those collaborations and use the resources here to help translate significant uh, research discovery to policy and social change. Our strengths currently, we have people who do neuroinflammation here. Uh, Katie uh, DeSico in biology. We have a number of people who do learning, memory, and cognition. Uh, Alan Silberberg, and clearly learning, memory, and cognition is in human uh, uh, cognition as well. Catherine Studley and, and of course, Sarah and Stacy and her group. Uh, hippocampal function is what I uh, look at. Psychostimulant drugs, Tony, David Kearns, and Maria Gomez. Neural protection, uh, Monica Conicleva. And Monica, uh, uh, she's looking at a thing called beta-lactams. One of the problems I have with trying to figure out how to solve this uh, issue of the inflammation is inflammation is, is good. I mean, it's starting out to protect you. And so let's imagine I put anti-inflammatory drugs and I take that protection away. Am I going to make the brain better? Chances are I'm not. One of the things that Monica is working on is um, she's looking at neuroprotective, uh, these beta-lactams are like penicillin. They are both neuroprotective and antimicrobial. 
And uh, they won't necessarily knock out inflammation, but they will provide neural protection. At least that's something we, I'd like to investigate with her. And she has some specialized ones that I think could be applicable here. Uh, childhood learning, nutrition, and fitness. Uh, clearly, those are things that we have strength in, as, as I mentioned with Sarah. We have people here that are going to do computational models, plus we're bringing in people who have computational models of these things. Current needs that we have, uh, I think we need to have people who do know the blood-brain barrier function. We need experts in that area. And we also need people who are experts in the molecular analyses of uh, brain physiology. And what I'm talking about there is how these uh, inflammation occurs, what's happening at the neural level and the cellular level in terms of these microglia and these, are we, are we getting cell loss? Um, what's producing the microglial response? Um, so. Uh, I think we could uh, attack these things across all of these levels. And um, what I see in, in with respect to this project and the center as a whole, okay, so I did, I mentioned before this is a model system, but I can see that AU could be a place for advancing the studies the, of these major problems that we have. And, they, and they, they have all kinds of facets to them where we can deal with behavioral excess, uh, dementia, cognitive decline, and we can be a place that's known for our abilities and our discoveries uh, and, and, and ways to help to prevent or uh, remedy these disorders. Okay. Thank you very much. We have, um, usually I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to tell people we have food. I'm a little terrified to tell you <laughs> after that talk. <laughs> that we do have food for a reception here. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, and I would actually offer the first one to Derek, if he has one, who has stayed up now. It was, it's now about 3.30 in the morning. Is he, he, they said he was still on, but, but we weren't seeing his photo. He may have nodded off. <laughs> he nodded off during my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just... Okay. All right. It, while they do that, um, I would ask if Scott would like to make some closing remarks. I think what we have heard today is pretty incredible um, for the way that, that the, the offer from the provost to be able to, to the faculty, to talk to me about big policy issues, about forward looking, about positioning the university for the student who will come here in 2030. Um, spawned enormous collaborations of big ideas. For somebody who has just come here a few months ago, I am, I am very proud to be affiliated with all of you. Um, and now from the provost's point of view, who started this. Well, well thank you. And, and I guess there's, there can be no greater reward, no greater reward to see uh, people creating and imagining the future. Our, our business we're in the business of creating dreams, and our administration is something some of the individuals in this room have selected to do, is uh, we have had the good fortune in our careers to have others who have provided the support, the infrastructure, getting the bureaucracy out of the way so we can be successful. And there can be, I said, no greater reward to see individuals to take up that, that opportunity and run with it. And I think for uh, Peter, who has been part of the, the foundation, other deans who, who are, are not here, to see that the little kernel of idea, the little seed we can do, the little bit of funding we can do, and it, and it is modest, but to give you the opportunity and the challenge to create is what a university is about. And that's what great universities are, are about. It is the sense that I can imagine, I can dream, and I can put pieces together, and they're going to be people, whatever they can, we can scrape it together so that you can achieve. And that's what I see happening here. Uh, I have no idea that these things, you know, I, you know, you don't, you know, going back to memory, I, you know, you're right, Tony, we did meet, but you know, it's, there's a hundred meetings I have, and that you never know what little bit you do and how it plays out in multiple ways, a domino effect. And for each of us, and I know there's some new associate deans that have come into this, it is a, a struggle uh, at times to be involved in administration, dealing with scarce resources, making choices uh, for investments. But there can be, as I said, no greater reward to see that people take the opportunity and turn it into something 
wonderful. And so those who are involved with uh, these and other projects that have used the collaboration, the opportunity not just here, but to collaborate around other universities, other parts of the world, to look to the future and understand the analysis of where we fit as an institution, where there is competition. In other words, if we're at this interface uh, that you've identified, you've both gone through some basic research, you've talked about uh, then uh, s specific niches that we could look at as collaboration. Just as the first group has done, there's a, there's a niche between a number of fields that we can contribute to. Is understanding that and that putting that together in a very dynamic way that builds institutional identity is precisely what a mid-sized university can do. We're mid-sized. We're not a big university where we can have, you know, my department of, actually I was a, in psychology in terms of my training a long time ago, there's 150 faculty in the psych department. Um, you know, you can cover so many areas. Uh, here, we're going to have to be selective and determining what we're not going to do as well as what we're going to do is also important in building the institution. So we need to know, let's take this particular example, where other institutions are at the interface uh, between obesity and uh, cognitive impairments and to know where we're going to uh, within that have our distinctive uh, aspects. I believe we already have that distinction at the interface between uh, disabilities, uh, the internet and technology. I mean, we, we already have assembled some of these people together and we need to get them working together. And, and it's harder for some of us in the social scientists. We have enormous territoriality and journals that are, and, and, and guilds that may restrict or even limit some of our our work as, as a collaboration. We need to push beyond that as a mid-sized university. Sciences have been much more driven by question and are prepared to answer those questions. I'm challenging the university in the social sciences to do precisely the same, is what's the question and then what are the intellectual tools to achieve that and how do we remove barriers across our schools and colleges, across our departments and across our, our disciplines to allow that to flourish. So, I've really appreciated what the library's put together, and it's great to hear what folks are really doing because we don't always get to do that. So, thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Um, before we have any dessert and we forget, I want you to fill out those little forms that are inside your, your program. Um, this particular program, Books and Beyond, is about the faculty and it's for the faculty. So if you would give us your ideas of what you would like to see the next time, we'd be delighted to run with that as well. Thank you for coming.